This may be an obvious statement, but there's a lot we don't know about our galaxy. That's not exactly a hot take. While we want to learn more about the Milky Way galaxy and beyond, it helps to better understand our own celestial backyard as well. In this case, I'm talking about the impacts of our own sun. It has a vast sphere of influence, both figuratively and quite literally. There's a constantly changing magnetic bubble protecting our solar system called the heliosphere. NASA has a spacecraft called IMAP, or the Interstellar Mapping and Acceleration Probe, that's set to study the heliosphere and create the first complete map of it. Before diving into the spacecraft itself, though, we asked IMAP Principal Investigator David McComas to give us an understanding of the heliosphere itself. So the heliosphere is basically a pressure balance between pressure outside the heliosphere and pressure from inside the heliosphere. On the outside, there's a dynamic pressure, just like when you drive your car through the air, it pushes back on your car. The faster you go, the more energy it takes to push the car through the air. There's also a magnetic field that wraps around the heliosphere and provides a, an asymmetric pressure. On the inside, the solar wind million mile an hour solar wind that's blowing out all directions in space all the time, inflates it from the inside and provides the pressure from the inside out. And where those two pressures match, you basically get the boundary between the two, the stuff from inside, solar material, and the stuff from outside, galactic material. The sun changes over the course of the solar cycle and over time, and so it blows more and less hard. And so this outer boundary also moves as the sun as the sun's pressure changes. Those following the study of heliophysics may recognize Dr. McComas. IMAP is actually his third time as a principal investigator. He was a PI on the Interstellar Boundary Explorer, or IBEX. Go for drop. The predecessor to IMAP, which launched back in 2008. It's a very small satellite, about 10% of the mass of this much larger spacecraft. It only had two sensors on it instead of 10 instruments. Um, but it made some of the first energetic neutral atom imaging of the outer heliosphere and proved that it was possible and made some of the initial discoveries. And it was based on all of the great science that came out of the early years of IBEX that basically the heliophysics community came together around this new mission called IMAP to do this much bigger, grander version where we're able to take much higher sensitivity observations. And combining that with all the in-situ observations and being able to do the full life cycle of these solar particles going out past L1, causing space weather, going to the outer heliosphere, interacting, and then some of them coming back in as neutral atoms. It's really a holistic scientific path that was built on this much smaller mission. IMAP was selected for maturation into a full mission in June 2018. It's gone through a barrage of tests in order to ensure that it can withstand the rigors of launch and operation in deep space. From spin balancing tests at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab in Maryland, to a 28-day stay in a thermal vacuum chamber at the Marshall Space Flight Center in Alabama. We got to see it during the last leg of its journey here on Earth at the Astrotech Space Operations Facility in Titusville, Florida. NASA invited members of the press to see the spacecraft along with NOAA's SWIFO-1 and the Carruthers Geocorona Observatory. We'll talk more about those two in separate videos. For the sake of this conversation, though, they're the two rideshare spacecraft that will be joining IMAP on a multi-month journey to their operating location, a gravitationally stable point in space about a million miles from Earth in between the Earth and the Sun called Lagrange Point 1. Yeah, so L1 is great. I, I already mentioned that uh, IBEX was the predecessor of IMAP. IBEX is in Earth orbit, and most of the backgrounds we have that limit our ability to do the ENA imaging have to do with the Earth's magnetosphere. And so getting far away from that was at one critical point. We also wanted to be important for space weather, so we wanted to be upstream of the Earth. The L1 is the natural location for that. And the fact that it goes around the sun with the Earth so that you cover, get full coverage every six months, just like you would in Earth orbit, sort of made that the clincher. It's also, for a bunch of engineering reasons, a pretty nice place to fly. It's very stable. You have a sun-pointed spinner like IMAP. You're always broadcasting aft towards the Earth. So it's, it's good for a bunch of science reasons and for engineering reasons. McComas and his team are planning to turn on all 10 of IMAP's instruments before the end of 2025 and begin what he calls a science demo phase. It's still before we get to L1, but we'd like to run in full normal science mode and make sure that it's exactly the way we want, we want to be running. And then uh, we burn in, I think it's January, I forget the exact date, but we burn in January and we go into this orbit about L1. Once we've proven that that's good, we move out of what's called phase D by NASA, which is 
goes through launch and commissioning and in orbit insertion. We go into phase E, which is the science phase, where we basically run the simple repetitive mission to take all this great data with our 10 instruments. Let's go back into the clean room to talk about the instruments and the spacecraft itself. For a sense of scale, this spacecraft is about 3 feet or 0.9 meters tall and is about 8 feet or 2.4 meters in diameter. Just a minute ago, you may recall McComas mentioned space weather. It's a term used to encompass the effects of the sun on the solar system. Those are things like solar flares, coronal mass ejections, and the release of particles dubbed the solar wind. Of the 10 instruments on board, six of them are keenly designed to study both short-term and long-term space weather. The short-term regular space weather has to do with the sun, things that come off, they take hours to days to get to the Earth and have an impact. But the entire heliosphere provides shielding for these galactic cosmic rays. And if you want to send astronauts to Mars, for example, they spend many months out in free space, away from the Earth's magnetosphere, largely unprotected because you can't fly enough protection around them to completely shield out these galactic cosmic rays. Well, it turns out that those galactic cosmic rays vary over the solar cycle because the shielding in the outer boundaries of the heliosphere varies. And so understanding that interaction better will make us better able to predict what the real risk assessment would be for astronauts traveling on their way to Mars. And so that's sort of the long-term space weather, space climate, also really important for humanity. To achieve that holistic understanding, three of those instruments, the Solar Wind and Pickup Ions, or SWAPI, the Compact Dual Ion Composition Experiment, or CODIS, and the High Energy Ion Telescope, or HIT, will study the solar wind and other energetic ions as they head out away from the sun. Meanwhile, the IMAP Low, the IMAP High, and the IMAP Ultra instruments track energetic neutral atoms that reach all the way out to the edge of the heliosphere and are bounced all the way back to IMAP. So we wanted to have two sets of instruments, a set of instruments that measured the ions coming out from the sun, from the solar wind at low energies all the way up to super thermals and energetic particles. And then they go out, they interact in some fraction, come back as energetic neutral atoms. We wanted to be able to cover this, the entire same energy range of those particles coming back so that we got the full life cycle of the particles. And that's what drove three of each. Most of the other instruments are also studying various aspects of the sun. The Global Wind Structure, or GLOWS instrument, is investigating the glow generated by solar wind and how it evolves over time. The Solar Wind Electron, or SWE, will measure the electrons found within that solar wind. And the magnetometer on top of the spacecraft, which will deploy once in space, is designed to measure the interplanetary magnetic field created by the Sun. But the tenth and largest instrument, called IDEX, or the Interstellar Dust Experiment, isn't studying the sun specifically. Rather, as the name suggests, it's designed to collect and study more interstellar dust in the course of just about a year than in the rest of the 50 plus years of space exploration put together. It's uh, really quite extraordinary. It not just measures the dust and the dust size and velocity, but actually the dust impacts a gold surface inside on the bottom. It gets vaporized and we sample the material com coming off of it. And that allows us to tell what it's made of. So we're not just learning about the size distribution of dust or the speed distribution of dust, but we're actually learning about the composition of each, and in each of these individual dust grains. So we're trying to understand what this interstellar dust is and what its origin is. It probably comes from exploded stars, nova and supernova, other stars in our galaxy that lived a long time ago, exploded, said, spent some of their material around, could be coming partially from the grinding up of planets or planetesimals or that sort of thing. Not much is known about it because very few dust grains have been directly sampled. So it's a real opportunity to learn about the stuff of the other stars and how it sort of makes its way into our own heliosphere over time and, and uh, what it tells us about the galaxy at large. IMAP has a life cycle cost of $781.8 million. That includes development, launch costs, and the planned two-year prime science mission. NASA booked SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket for $109.4 million, which will feature not only IMAP, but also the Carruthers Geocorona Observatory, another NASA mission, and the Space Weather Follow-On Lagrange 1, or SWIFO L1 spacecraft from NOAA. Because of the uniqueness of this ride, you know, we wanted to make sure to take advantage of that. That's why our partners at, at NOAA, as well as our ability to bring Carruthers along with the IMAP mission, it's so really valuable. Um, we had an early mission that was long for the ride that didn't quite make it, you know, wasn't quite ready in time. 
a tech technology development mission for solar sales. Um, a lot of that work has continued forward and hopefully we'll be able to get a ride in the future. As mentioned, IMAP is slated for a two-year nominal science mission, but like with many other NASA spacecraft, there's a good chance that it could be collecting quality science data for quite a bit longer than that. We have expendables on board for at least five years, guaranteed. And if we get anything close to a nominal launch, we'll have lots of gas that we could go for many decades. Um, IBEX, which was a small explorer and built to a lower quality standard and all of that, just because it was an inexpensive mission, is still functioning 17 years after launch. It's still functioning today. We hope it'll be functioning when we get IMAP up and we'll be able to cross calibrate between the two in space, taking observations, looking the same direction at the same time and be able to take the whole 17 year data set from IBEX and link it into this much more sensitive and accurate set of measurements from IMAP. So if you can do that with the SMEX, we hope to be able to run IMAP for, for decades, to be honest. And as IMAP is with us potentially for decades to come, McComas says among the things he's most looking forward to are the discoveries that no one could have predicted. Yeah, so as an experimental space physicist, the most exciting thing is you design the instruments, you design the mission, you want to measure something that's not been measured before, or you want to measure something much better than it's been measured before, and you do all that work, you build it, you qualify it, you get it on a spacecraft, you launch the spacecraft, you commission it in space, you get the science data back, and then you learn a lot of stuff from that, you write a lot of great science papers, and you go all the way full circle, and you try to figure out how to make the measurements better. That's the process we've run through IBEX and now into IMAP. And so it's really exciting to, to get the entire life cycle and to be able to basically steer the field and the science in the field by making the right observation. Reporting for Spaceflight Now, I'm Will Robinson-Smith.